tell me when I'm ready and I'm going to get started. Good morning. Thank you all for joining us again for another time in Sunday School. We're so glad that you've joined us. And if you'll just take a moment and share on Facebook as well as on YouTube, we'll give you a few moments to do that. And we'll get started with our teaching for today. God bless everybody that's joining us. Thank you for that. And um, we hope that you're enjoying this new series that we've started, our new quarter. Our new quarter is Jesus and the Just Reign of God. And um, this is going to be good. We've talked about Mary's uh, song of praise, a praise song. And here again, we're continuing to talk about going into Zacharias's uh, prophecy or prophesying about his son, John the Baptist. And we're going to read those, this, this, these scriptures. And um, I believe the Lord has a word for us again during our time of Sunday school. So if you've shared and I've shared, I believe that the Lord will speak to us. Let's get into our study for today. Our Bible basis is found in the book of Luke, chapter 1, verses 57 through 58, then verses 67 through 79. Um, so let's look there. There's a typo in our, if you have a book, there's a little typo there, but let's read there. And then our Bible truth is found is this. God rewards faith and punishes unbelief. The Bible truth is God rewards faith and punishes unbelief. Our memory verse is found in Luke chapter 1, verses 76 through 77. And it reads like this. And thou, child, shalt be called the prophet of the highest. For thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. To give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins. Let's read that again. And thou, child, shalt be called the prophet of the highest. For thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins. The lesson aim is by the end of the lesson, we will review the story of Zacharias' prophecy concerning his son John the Baptist, gain an appreciation for prophecy, and reflect on expectations we have for the next generation and address the justice modeled in Zacharias's prophecy. I know the word address was not in all caps, but I do think it should have been. So, you know, just bear with me. Um, so let's read that again just for good measure. The lesson aim is by the end of the lesson we will Review the story of Zacharias' prophecy concerning his son, John the Baptist. Gain an appreciation for prophecy and reflect on expectations we have for the next generation and address the justice modeled in Zacharias' prophecy. So let's look at our scripture text for this morning, all right? And um, let's go here. Luke chapter 1 Verses, verse 57 through 58 says this. Verse 57. Now Elizabeth's, Elizabeth's full time came that she should be delivered, and she brought forth a son, just like it was prophesied, right? And her neighbors and her cousins heard how the Lord had showed great mercy upon her, and they rejoiced with her. Verse 67. And his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord. Now, I know they left out a section, but hopefully you all are aware of it, but we may go back and catch that. Uh, and his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people and has raised up an horn of salvation for us. In the house of his servant David, as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, 
which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies. There's so much in here. Saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us. To perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he sware to our father Abraham, that he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And thou, child, shalt be called the prophet of the highest, thou, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by remission of their sins through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet in feet into the way of peace. Glory to God. Now, I know y'all know the story as we approach December uh, 25th. You know, people tell the story often, but let me just remind you that Zacharias, of course, could not speak prior to this moment at um, around verse 67. And we understand that they ask him what should be the name of this child. And typically a child is named, um, a, given a name that is uh, in the lineage or somewhere in that family. And um, Elizabeth said John, but of course, I think Elizabeth said John, but uh, they were like, no, 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 you know, we need to add, Zacharias needs to speak. He's, he's got, so Zacharias wrote down, his name shall be called John. And they were like, what's going on here? And when he wrote that name down to agree with what the angel had already said, his mouth, his tongue was loosed and he began to give God praise. Beloved, we've got to learn to praise God. We must learn to agree. What was, our, what was our Bible truth? God rewards faith and he punishes unbelief. You know, I would even go as far to say it isn't so much that he punishes unbelief uh, than there is a disqualifier for not walking in faith. There are benefits we don't get. There are things that, call, that happen or that God removes his hand from from us that allows the adversary uh, a, a reign to step in because we don't maintain our walk of faith. There's something about our walking and living and being in faith that will cause God, hallelujah, to fulfill his promise. So when Zechariah did not, he started questioning and asking all these things. Uh, he was a priest, remember. He was serving in the house of God. He ought to have had faith. He didn't. He began questioning and asking all these things. And they said, you're going to be silent until the day that these things happen. It's going to be a sign to you. That's what the angel said. And that's what happened. And as soon as this baby was born and he agreed with the angel and said his name shall be called John, his tongue was loose, he began to speak, and here is what he said. But let's go back up just to Elizabeth. I want to go back up just a little bit, just a little bit. So you have here um, verse 58. It says, the Lord has showed great mercy upon her, and they rejoiced with her. Now, you know the story. She was old. They had no children. But God gave a promise, and God fulfilled that promise. And instead of them being uh, pity and uh, this old woman having this child, here you have them rejoicing because there was joy about her having not necessarily just a baby, but she had a son. It was important and significant for her to have a son. Main reason was because that's what was prophesied by the angel. That was what was foretold by the angel. Let me give you those definitions of the word prophecy. It means to speak forth by divine inspiration, to predict, 
sometimes with the mm -hmm. idea of foretelling future events pertaining especially to the kingdom of God. It is to foretell events that are going to happen. What did the angel say? You're going to have a son. He didn't just say you're going to have a baby. You're going to have a son, and it happened. So you have that taking place, and God fulfilled it. And I keep telling y'all, God keeps his promises. He keeps his promises. Glory to God. And here you have, she brought forth a son. And there is, uh, you, you, you must understand that during their time, having a son was significant because the blessing passed down. The seed, of course, passed down to the son. The seed passed down to, through the son. So that lineage would be still, would be carried on. Here, verse 58 says that the Lord showed great mercy upon her by her having a son, and they rejoiced with her. And we skip down to verse 67. And his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied. Had he prophesied before? No, there's no record. But here he begins to exalt and to magnify God and do what our lesson aim says. Review the story of Zacharias' prophecy concerning his son John the Baptist and gain an appreciation for, for prophecy and reflect on expectations we have for the next generation. John the Baptist was the next generation. And we understand that God has next generations now. We should want God to, to give us words to speak over our next generation. They need to know God has a plan and purpose for their lives. They're not here by happenstance or by chance. They are here by purpose. John the Baptist had, they call him the Baptist because he baptized, not because he was of the Baptist Reformation, because they didn't have such a thing. Okay, I want to make sure y'all understand that. Praise God, hallelujah. But we have to understand that God uh, was going to fulfill his promise that he had given. Let's read on. Verse 68, Zechariah says, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. Hallelujah. For he had visited and redeemed his people. He had plenty of time. He couldn't talk. He had plenty of time that he could muse and think and ponder. And had raised up an horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. He understood what God was doing now. He understood how God had had moved uh, supernaturally, in, supernaturally for him, supernaturally for Mary. God was had orchestrated. I love the word orchestrate. God had orchestrated things to show Himself strong for His people. Isn't that something that we saw in the lesson last week? where God was going to cause his people, the lowly people, to be exalted? Here, you see in verse 68, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. He has visited and redeemed his people. Redeemed them, he is restoring to them something that they had lost. He is restoring to them. He has visited and redeemed his people. So let's look at this. I want, I want y'all to pay attention to this. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. He has visited. He's re redeemed. And then Zechariah says this. He has raised up. Hallelujah. These are all words that signify action. God is doing something. And we don't always see what God is doing, but this prophecy fulfills what God had already promised. He was going to raise up a forerunner who was going to declare the way of the Lord. Here, let me read because I, I need us to get it. He has, he has visited, redeemed, and raised up an horn of salvation, deliverance. He has rescued us in the house of, of his servant David. He didn't forget. He did not, God did not forget. 
Verse 70, as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since, have been since the world began. It may look like God isn't going to do it, but beloved, God can, he can turn around in one day. He can make it happen in one day. Hallelujah. He can bring it to pass in one moment. Verse 71, that we should be what? Saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us. What was God going to do? Save them from their enemies and everybody that hated them. They were in a season where everybody hated them. God was going to save them. He was going to uh, save them from their enemies and everybody that hated them. He was going to redeem their lives from destruction. He is still redeeming our lives from destruction. Listen, the enemy comes not except, that's what it means, for to steal, to kill, and right to destroy. But here you have Zacharias saying that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us. And then God was going to do something else. He was going to perform the mercy promised. He was going to perform the mercy promised. God promised mercy. Us not getting what we deserve. He was going to give us what we did not deserve. Mercy. They are new every morning. New every morning, great is thy, great is, his mercies are new every morning. To perform the mercy promised and to remember his holy covenant. We talked about covenant in our last quarter. God is a God of covenant. He makes an agreement and he remembers it. He keeps covenant. He keeps covenant. He will remember his covenant with us. He'll perform, and I wish you had a, your book or your Bible to circle that. He'll perform the covenant. He'll perform the mercy. And he'll remember the covenant. Bless our God. I think I'll highlight that too. Uh, he'll perform the mercy and remember the covenant. God will do that. But Zacharias was reminding the people, really, prophecy, sometimes it comes to foretell, but it reminds us of, us of something God already said. It foretells what he's already promised, and it stirs us and tells us he's going to do that and some more. And to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he sware to our father Abraham. An oath is a promise. When you make a covenant, you take an oath. You go before, today we go before notary public. And we say, uh, we swear that this is the truth. We take an oath. And we declare that this is, when we get married, we take an oath. We make a covenant before God and before man. And we agree this is what we're going to do. We agree that we're not going to break that vow. We agree that we're going to agree to, we're going to keep our, we're not, we're going to forsake all others and cleave to our wife. We, we, uh, we make an oath, the oath which he swear to our father. What was that oath? He was going to protect Israel. He was going to bring them into a promised land that he was going to be their God. They were going to be his people. God gave a promise. God keeps his promise. He was going to perform the mercy and remember his holy covenant. Praise our great God. That's what he promised. He was going to perform and remember. Perform and remember. Again, Look, uh, look further, that he would grant unto us that we, being delivered out of the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear. Hallelujah. God wants us to serve him without fear. 
without any fear. No fear that anybody would cause us harm, without fear that there are repercussions, fear that we will be taken advantage of, without fear. But there's a posture to that fear. It says, in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our lives. Even though we say we're coming to people come to church and they're coming to serve the Lord, but he says you got to serve me without fear in holiness. In holiness. In reverence. You've got to honor me. We've got to choose him. When it comes time for us to choose between doing something that dishonors God and something that honors God, we've got to reverence God and choose him. The fear of the Lord, fear of man brings a snare, but honoring God produces life, eternal life. Honoring God produces favor. That we would serve him without fear in holiness. Separation from the world, dedicated to God. And righteousness, having our having right standing with him through Jesus Christ. In holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our... These things must matter because this is what Zacharias is prophesying over his son. He's talking about... He, well, he's talking about everything, but he does talk about, the next verse talks about his child. But he's saying that God was going to do all these things. He started in verse 68 saying, blessed be the God of Israel who, who has visited and redeemed his people. Because God provides all these things for his, for his people. We are the people of God called by his name. That's us. That's us. We belong to God. This is talking about what he provides for us. If we could just believe that. That he provides these things for us. With us in mind. All right. That he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might, that we would be delivered out of the hand of our enemies. We have to remember we have enemies. Though they may smile in our face, we have enemies. We have adversaries. And thou, child, talking about his son, John the Baptist, shalt be called the prophet of the highest. For thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways. He was going to be the forerunner of Jesus Christ. The voice of the one crying in the wilderness, saying, prepare ye the way of the Lord. He was the one called to go before him to prepare the way, to announce his coming. Who he said, I'm not even worthy to lace up his shoes. John understood the assignment. But this prophecy was spoken by his daddy before he ever got there. He was spoken by his father before he ever got there. Before he ever understood what his assignment was, it was spoken. Listen, beloved, there is purpose in our existence. Jesus said, no, nobody's ever prophesied over me. It doesn't matter. There, you, you, you may, you, I understand sometimes we need definition, but the greatest definition of who you are and what you're called to do comes from God telling us that and God orchestrating that and putting people who have no idea who we are telling us and giving us that. Sometimes we're looking for it from people we hold in high esteem, but we really need God to orchestrate that for us. Mm. here from for John the Baptist. 
The scripture doesn't tell us that his daddy ever said this to him so that his ears could literally hear it. But let's see what his daddy says. Thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, plural. You are going to, he, you're going to be the one to prepare the ways of the Lord. John had a unique relationship with God. Hallelujah. He was the one who was uh, wearing camel's hair and eating locust and wild honey. He was the one that people didn't quite get or understand. It didn't change the fact that he was still the one who this prophecy was spoken about. And he was the one who was heralding in the coming of the Lord Jesus. Verse 77 says this. This child was also going to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by remission of, of their sins. He was the one who was going to be baptizing them unto repentance. Showing them that what they were doing was sin. That what they had been doing wasn't sufficient. Taking sacrifices to the temple to sacrifice them wasn't enough. He was, he was, he was rocking the boat, so to, so to speak. He was the one causing an upheaval in the spiritual establishment. They didn't want, they were not okay with John. Here. To give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins. Through, verse 78, through the tender mercy of our mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us. John was going to show a different side of God that they had not known. They had seen the religious leaders. They had seen them. But he was going to show the tender mercy of our God. The tender mercy of our God. Whereby, and this word day spring is one of our definitions. It's um, a rising of the sun and stars, the dawn. He's talking about the, the beginning of something new. The day spring on high, from on high, hath visited us. It's the dawning of a new day, a new era. John the Baptist was going to begin, be the beginning of something different. John tells us in, the, in John chapter 1, he says, I was not that light, but I was sent to bear witness of it. I'm not the light, but I came to bear witness of it. I'm not the light. I'm different. I'm unique. But I'm not the light. I'm not even worthy to lace up his shoes. It's good you need to know your assignment. So when people try to drag you into something that's not your assignment, you stay in your assignment. Here it is. 79 says, to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. Remember this. Grace and truth came through Jesus. It came through Jesus. What they had was not sufficient. Was not sufficient. There was a better way. And Jesus came to bring that. Jesus came to bring that. And when we look, I want to, I didn't do my lesson aims. Let's do the aims and we'll discuss those. But I want us to understand that God's had a way that here you have Zacharias prophesying about his son, John, but not even just John, but he was talking about how God was going to cause that horn of salvation to rise up. Glory to God to cause that horn of salvation to rise up out of the house of David and he was coming to fulfill what God had promised. 
And that child, his child, was going to be the forerunner to prepare the ways. And that's what John the Baptist did. Let's look at some of these aims they have in our study for this morning. Here, it says, students will learn that nothing is impossible with God. Nothing. I know we will put limitations on God, and we will say what God cannot do. We will say this is an impossibility. We will, but God knows what he's doing. We are only required to believe what God says in his word. We are only required to speak his word above everything else, to agree with God, to agree with God. Can we just do that? And expect God to make up the difference. That nothing is impossible with God. Elizabeth and Zacharias had served God. Had served God. They wanted a child, had not had one. And God didn't just give them an ordinary child. They gave them a John the Baptist who would be the one to give light to them that sit in darkness. Were there some dark areas? Absolutely. But he was the one who was going to be the forerunner to give light to them that sit in darkness and those who sit in the shadow of death to guide their feet into peace. Hallelujah! To guide their feet into the way of peace. God always wanted us to have peace with him. To have peace. So it's not an impossibility. Just because things have always been that way doesn't mean they have to stay that way. God's way is always the best way. The next lesson aim is that students will learn from biblical history the relationship of prophecy and faith. Zacharias learned the importance of um, the relationship between prophecy and faith. We must believe God. We must believe God. We must believe God. We say that when people backslide or they turn from the Lord, they've lost their faith. The enemy is after our faith. But we can't, there, there's a song, ain't giving up no ground. I'm not giving up any ground, no ground. I'm not giving up any. God is a covenant-keeping God. He is a covenant-keeping God. What pleases God is when we believe him. Like any parent, you want your children to believe you, to expect good from your hands. Correction, sure, but you want them to expect good from your hands. Let's expect the same from our God. Let's expect the same from our God. Let's read our next aim. I think this is our next one. Let me look real quick. Um, so as we look at that, we see um, that God's word, they're the relationship between prophecy and faith. God looks for people who are going to, and, and really who are going to believe his word. Not that God's going to just, it's going to automatically happen. We must be in the pursuit of God. We must be, be in pursuit of the things of God. We must be in pursuit of what honors God. Let's look at our next aim. It says, my time is, is dwindling down here. He says, aim, our next aim is students will understand that God is displeased with unbelief as well as uh, belief. It says, we live in a society where that prides itself upon its right to exercise freedom of speech. Though we can freely say whatever we think and feel, this lesson shows us we ought to exercise our right to remain silent. Because that's exactly what Zechariah did. What if we were arrested every time we spoke against 
the Lord. Zacharias' ability to speak was taken away when he verbalized unbelief. The word unbelief means I is refusing to believe God. And sometimes we can be so um, not so in disbelief or not expecting to see good that we don't even just believe that God can do it. Sometimes you need, you have the right to be quiet. You have the right to be quiet, to be quiet. Here, he says, growing up we are taught how and when to speak. Spiritual maturity is evidenced by those who know how and when not to speak. I still believe that's why the scripture tells us to study to be quiet. Because there is an art to knowing when to be quiet. When to be quiet. Here, our next uh, Bible lane is that, so we, we, we need to gather that students will begin to use positive words instead of negative ones. Let me read this little section. This week, challenge yourself to practice something you learned when you were a child, to only speak if you have something nice to say. Enjoy a week without complaining, cursing, or criticizing. It should be a week of positivity. Now, we should challenge ourselves as people of God to always have words that are fitly spoken, uh, like like. Uh, apples of gold and pictures of silver. That is what the scripture tells us. We should always try to make sure that our words are words that are appealing. Everybody may not be pleased with what you say, but your words should certainly be words that will, are filled with grace, that are filled with grace, that are filled with grace. So there is a prayer here at the end. I want to do the, read this prayer to you and then we want to do our closing. Father, it says that, Father, we praise you because we know that nothing is impossible for you. Nothing is impossible for God, beloved. So whatever the enemy is telling you is impossible, just remember, nothing is impossible for God. You still need to seek the Lord because some things are just not inside his will. You are the all-powerful God of the universe. We thank you that you choose to call us your people, and we can call on you in prayer. Lord, we ask that you strengthen our hearts so we can walk by faith and believe you for the impossible things in our lives. In Jesus' name, we pray. We need to believe God for what appears to be impossible. Because what's impossible for us, many times, are possible with God. Because God is able to do just what he said he would do. He's going to fulfill every promise to you. Don't give up on God. I know it's a song because he won't give up on you. He is able. And not just he's able, saints, he's willing also. He's willing also. Also, I wanted to take a moment and I want to share the, um, the link for next week's lesson to make sure I get that in. Uh, we want to share that because I, it's important that you're able to prepare for the lesson. Even if you just get a chance to, if you don't do the home daily Bible readings, at least read the scripture text for the next Sunday's lesson so that you'll be prepared for that. But God wants us to be challenged in our walk with him, to be challenged so that we'll be able to stay the course and not be uh, caught off guard so that as the Lord speaks to us, as he deals with us, as he helps us, as I know that he will, we will reap every benefit that he has for us. We will reap every benefit that he has for us. God has plans for you, beloved. God has plans for you. And as we look into these scriptures today, we are reminded that God wants to perform the mercy he promised. 
Sometimes we get too busy to remember and to recall to mind what God has promised to us. Take the time and write down what God has promised you and write the scriptures that go along with it and begin to confess that word over your own life, to begin to confess that word and to speak it until you see it manifested in your life, until the peace of God envelops your heart and your mind and speak it over the next generation speak it over the next generation speak it over the sons and daughters speak it over others until they begin to expect God to move for them because God really is a good God the good God the mighty God there is no God like our God glory to God amen and amen. I want to pray with you before we go. We have just a little time left, but I want to pray with you. And I know that God remains faithful. He remains faithful. The Bible says the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth, looking to show himself strong on the behalf of those whose hearts are perfectly his. Let's keep our hearts soft before him. Father, we thank you so much for what you've begun in us. Finish what you've started. We say yes to you and yes to your will, yes to your word, dear Lord God. Keep our hearts open before you. We thank you even now. We bless you. We decree and declare that it, your will will be done in us and that what you've promised, you'll bring it to pass. You'll perform the mercy promised and you'll remember your holy covenant. In Jesus' name we pray. So it is. Amen. All right, everybody, our time is virtually gone, and I just pray that the Lord will bless you and keep you, and that you will join us next Sunday morning at 9 a.m. for Sunday school. Worship service should begin very shortly. Join us here at 10 a.m., and then uh, next Sunday morning at 9 a.m., Sunday school, you have the link for the Sunday school next Sunday morning. We'll be talking about the Messiah arrived as we approach our Christmas Day um, service but we or not service but our christmas uh event we pray that the word of god is blessing you um we hope that you'll join us next sunday morning and invite somebody to join us please share this video that someone else can be blessed and encouraged let's be a blessing to someone else uh join us next sunday morning or stay tuned again for our worship service that begins at 10 a.m uh, until then god bless you may the lord carry you until the next time god bless you